Welcome to At the Crossroads Church weekly podcast. Our hope is that you will grow in your walk with God and be blessed and encouraged in your daily lives as you listen. You can visit us at our website at atthecrossroads.ca. Well, good morning, Crossroads. I want to say, first of all, thank you for your love and your support of the National this year. I think, how many, 12, 14 came down? 16 came. You, you probably had the biggest representation of any group in all Canada. Right from this church here. How many had a good time when you were down? One, two, three. Okay. No. okay. no, we had a great national, and God really did some great things inside of the churches and leaders. And we're all about really uh, relationships, Kathy and I, but also connecting. We don't see your pastors as distant relatives. We believe that we're family. Amen. And we come in, we want to come alongside younger pastors and, and help them. We have a little bit of experience that we've had. Between Kathy and I, we have 85 years of ministry experience. Okay, between us, okay? We're not 85 years old. Okay, and uh, anyway, Kathy's got a couple years up on me in that area, so we're very thankful. We were in uh, the British Isles for our anniversary, okay? And Kathy and the Edmonton Castle, I was getting the headsets for the tour of the castle, and she turned around and didn't see a step, and she tripped and ripped her cap muscle. Okay, very painful. Anyway, to make a long story, she's, it didn't stop her from doing anything, but it sure slowed things down. So I feel like uh, the superstar muscle man today because I pushed a wheelchair for the last 10 days. Okay, on cobblestone roads and everything else, all through Scotland and England and France and uh, Norway. We went up actually four days in Norway. What a beautiful area. Uh, they say it's not the good time of the year to go. We had perfect weather. We saw all the fords. It's one of the most gorgeous areas in the entire planet. Amen? So anyway, we're here today, and are you all ready for God's word? Yeah. Okay, everybody stand up for a moment, and let's give God thanks, first of all, that this is a church that believes in the public reading of the scriptures. Amen? What you just saw when the, the team got up there, they declared God's word. How many know the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 4, 16, that we are to publicly read the scriptures? This is a church that's doing that. That doesn't happen everywhere. Amen? So let's give God thanks for his word right now. Amen? Father, let's say it. I believe what your word says is applicable, is relevant, is reliable, is dependable for my life today. You said, how will a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed to your word. Lord, we apply it today to our lives, to our marriages, to our homes, to our families, to the community of Trenton, to the church, and together we will see the glory of God. Amen. High five that one around you. Come on. Amen. We're going to get into the word. Okay. As we go to the word of God, I want to just state this here this morning. I'm going to share probably something that some of you have already heard and maybe that you haven't, but it really doesn't matter. How many know faith arises by hearing and hearing by the word of God? And I'm going to be bringing experiences together today. Experiences without the word, I question but experiences that are backed by the Word of God, I'm very thankful for. And I want to just fast forward you. I want to take you back on a journey for just a few moments, back 38 years ago. And I came to the community of Windsor, and I started a church with a vision. I started a church with a couple dozen people. And 38 years ago, I had no money whatsoever. We had no building. We had no property. We had no bank account. We had absolutely zero 38 years ago. Go back 44 years ago, we had no relatives uh, other than my grandmother that was saved in the Shematero family. Today, fast forward now 40 some years, there's hundreds of them. There's last we heard about 550 now are now saved. Ones that were the drug traffickers and everything are all out of that thing now and all tracking with God. Amen? So I can tell you those experiences are all in line with what the Word of God says because we started claiming household salvation on both sides of the bloodline, mom's side and dad's side, and just seeing things happen. Amen? Then in the same respect now, I want to go back to 38 years ago. We had no buildings. Okay? Today, fast forward 38 years later, 
we went through five major building programs. Two of those there programs, listen very carefully, were totally dedicated, debt-free, with no mortgage of any kind on them. One of them was dedicated and fell short about six months, okay? It was paid off in, the third one. The fourth one was about a year that we took us to get the whole thing out. And one of the building programs in the middle in there, it took us a little bit longer to get it because somebody had pledged to us that they were giving us a $3 million gift, okay? That they had a parcel of land outside of London, Ontario, that they were donating to the church, and he was a marketplace guy with inside the community. So they signed the contract based upon what the guy had said, and he didn't end up having what he had said he did. Set us up in a position that we had to struggle for, actually, for almost about three years before we had that one paid off. I say all that there. Back up 38 years ago, we had no full-time employees at WCF. I was paid $200 a week. Fast forward, we got over 50 employees today between the Windsor Life Center and that. Back up, we had zero computers. Today, we have over 90-some. I think it's 96 computers that we actually have today. Back up, we had no equipment. Today, we have five trucks. We have our own lawnmowers. We have our own tractors. We have five trucks to pick up all the food and, and all the stuff for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the Benevolence Center. Okay, now I'm saying all that. September 9th, Pastor Travis knows this and Camilla, uh, we turned over our church to our son with zero debt, come on, and $17 million plus in assets. I'm saying all that, okay, not to have anything to do or to brag about us. I'm saying all that because these things just don't happen. There are laws that we operate in from the scriptures, and when we take the word of God and we apply the scriptures, let me tell you, Windsor was a community that even from the immigration, when I got landed, the immigrate, at the immigration they said, do you know how many preachers have actually came to Canada from the States? And I said, no, I don't, sir. He said, I know a bunch of them that have all come. And you know what? Just like you, it's going to happen. You're not going to be able to get it. It's not going to work like you think it's going to work. Well, six months later, I came back with all the financial statements by Christmas at the end of that year. I took it all in, brought it to the man, and he says, well, you're one of the lucky ones. I said, no, I believe it's God's favor on my life. Amen? And so anyway, he gave me my landing immigrant so I could get in before I got my citizenship. I'm saying all that there because there was experiences and there was things that Kathy and I have learned over these here 85 years that I want to talk to you about today. Is that okay? And, and there, there's three laws that all work together. You cannot separate one from the other. And when these laws go into operation inside of your life, inside of the church, inside the ministry, they will change the whole dynamic of everything. What God did for us in Windsor was an impossibility to many, but how many know with God all things are possible? And so what I want to share with you today is there's four stories in the Word of God, and the four stories are all exactly the same. When God says in the Word, He gives a story, and He says it one time, how many know that one time is more than enough for me to heed it, to act upon it, and to see it come to pass? But if God goes and says the same story twice, how many know we just need to back up, and we need to really pay attention to what it is that God said, because there's lessons and learning inside there that our principles are going to guide your life, that are going to affect your life and every detail of your life. But if God uses Matthew to say the same thing that Mark said, and Mark the same th thing that Luke said, and Luke the same thing that John said, how many know there just might be something within there that is relevant for us, that is ap applicable for us today, that can change our life? I didn't even know what I'm sharing today back then, but I did operate in these here principles, and after, thir after 38 years of pastoring, now going into 44 years of ministry, because within the first year of ministry, I was preaching the Word of God. I was overseeing the youth department at the Catholic Charismatic Meeting and was very, very involved in ministry, and I operated in all three of these laws and didn't even know that they were in the Bible, didn't even know the understanding that I have today. So from that experience, we're going to learn something today. Now, let me just give you the context. How many know that many, uh, many leaders today take verses and scriptures out of their context? Okay, what do you mean by that? They take a passage of the Word of God. You know when it says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. How many know that's in the Bible? 
I said, how many know that's in the Bible? But I've had many believers quote the verse, but they never met the conditions for that to happen in their lives. Take the whole context of Philippians chapter 4, and it speaks about a missionary offering contextual that was given. And Paul said to the Philippians that had backed him, that had supported him, and sowed in him, but my God is going to supply all your need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. They had the seeds already in the ground when God spoke that to them. Are you all there today? I, 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 I'm going to try to behave as much as I can because this is the passion inside me. Okay? These three laws, when they're in operation, will change your marriage, will change your perspective, and will change your life. How many are ready for change? Matthew chapter 14. Kind of turn it up if you can. Matthew chapter 14 is one of the four that I just mentioned to you a moment ago that we're going to read about. And in Matthew chapter 14... This is the first time that he brings it out in the Gospels. Matthew says this here, Mark says this here, Luke says this, and John says that. Okay, look what he says. Matthew 14, 14, okay? Contextual. John the Baptist just got beheaded. That's the context of this here story. Matthew says it, Mark says it, and Luke says it. The beheading of John was very detrimental to the church world at this here time. The beheading of John affected all the disciples because all the disciples knew John the Baptist. They knew about him personally because he was a cousin of Jesus, but they also knew about his ministry and the effect that that ministry had. So these principles that Jesus is going to teach us are all intertwined over here in Matthew 14. So here's it is, John gets beheaded, and Jesus, when he hears the report about John, he needs to pull away, and he goes to an isolated place, and he goes away to get before his father. After he did that, he came back, and this is where we pick up. Let me tell you, when tragedies hit your life, it's not a time to run away from God, but it's a time to run to God. When challenges come to your life, it's not a time to divide, but it's a time to unite with the Godhead in the, in the place in corporate area of prayer. Amen? And this is exactly what the Son of God does. And then he comes back, and notice what he says over here in Matthew 14. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Okay, think about that. There's probably at least 20,000 people here. There's 5,000 men plus children. They didn't have birth control like we have today. They didn't believe in small families like we have today. Are you there? So here's the men, the teenagers, and the children all together. And notice what it says. Buy them food. And he said, but Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves. Everybody say five loaves and two fish. And then he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave it to the multitudes so that they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Same thing in Mark, same thing in Luke, same thing in John. Number one thing that Jesus did is he looked up to heaven. He looked beyond what he saw in the temporal realm. He looked beyond what he saw in the natural realm. He looked beyond what was happening with the beheading of John the Baptist. He looked beyond the multitudes, and he took what he had, and he looked up to heaven. Come on. And then what did he do when he looked up to heaven? It tells us he got his focus into the right place. And what did he do? He blessed. The word blessed is actually translated in John's gospel, chapter 6, as thanks. Everybody say thanks. It's the same exact word because it means to invoke by divine authority the favor and gratitude of God into a situation. So Jesus gave thanks over here. Now, this is what I want you to understand. They took five loaves and two fishes. Five is the number of the grace of God. The grace of God is already in your life. The grace of God is already upon your life. Are we doing okay? It's not something you're trying to get. You already got the grace of God through the new birth. Not only is the number five, because five means grace, but it's also the number of divine weakness. 
We can see the woman at the well had five husbands. We can see Lazarus, the rich man, in Lazarus' story, he had five brothers, speaking of the weakness. We can see also that every one of us here has five physical senses. We can see also out there, there was five Levitical offerings. We're not going to get into all that today. But five was very significant, and it speaks about, listen very carefully, the grace of God. And two is the number. It's amazing. It wasn't three fish, or it wasn't one fish, or it wasn't five. It was two fish, because two is the number of union. The two Two shall become one. If any two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done by my Father. Five and two together equals seven. Seven is the divine completion, the divine number. These are not just in here stories. Biblical numer num num numerology is very important to God, and it should be very important to us today. Amen? So we got now the divine completeness of the offering to God that went up. Now here's the first thing that you understand. I've recognized that Rick Shemitero's life, my whole life is in the seed. The seeds that leave my hand never leave my life but continue to produce. I could take you back over these last 43 years and show you right for our 38 years we use from the church and show you the track record of seeds and the seeds that we planted from the word of God. Come on, how they planted them into the hearts of individuals that had nothing, that were broke, that were losers, that were write-offs in the culture and society. And today they're some of the most successful, uneducated people, the most successful entrepreneurs in all history. They're breaking record after record after record today because we got the word of God inside their heart. Now this is what I've learned about the area of giving. When we speak of giving, the first thing that people think of is what? Come on. Is the area of what? Of tithing, right? But how about this here? How about giving God the first part of your day? Have you ever thought about giving God the first part of your day. Have you ever thought about, and they sang it today, which is amazing, in the songs. Twice it said it in the reading of the scripture and also in the song today about giving God your whole heart. How many know this doesn't work when God has a piece of our heart? It doesn't work when we're holding things back from God. Come on. But it works when God, God says, if you'll search for me with your whole heart, you're going to find me. Amen. So how about giving God your whole heart? How about this here, giving God your faith, uh, a daily boost by hearing God's word over and over and over. Can I give you a little understanding today on faith? Faith is a part of the new creation. The Bible says one of the fruits of the Spirit is faith. I have an Aramaic scholar that actually lived in the city of Tilbury, just about 30 minutes away from where I live. And he came to me one day, he said, Rick, you guys got it all wrong in the church world out there. You, you teach it that faith cometh. It's future tense, cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He said, listen, in the Aramaic, he said, faith is awakened by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, it's already on the inside, but what happens is the, the disclosure of it, the revelation of it, the understanding of it, the application of it is all coming. It's all there by revelation, by hearing it over and over and over. So how about daily giving yourself a faith boost? And how about this here, giving, listen very carefully, help to others' dreams. See, what I've learned over these here 44 years now is the dreams that other people have had. I came alongside them and did everything within my ability to help their dream come to pass. Wasn't even concerned about my dream, but I was more concerned about helping the dream of someone else. And I got in there and I, get, and I came alongside and did everything within my ability to help someone else's dream come to pass. See, this is what we're talking about giving. You look at the end results today, or you see the results that have transpired. But I'm telling you, I came alongside the elders in the Catholic charismatic meeting and said, what can we do to serve? What can we do to help? What can we do to assist? What can we do in any way? Come on. And they put me over the book table. They put me over setting up chairs in the sanctuary. They put me in ushering. I dropped more people than we caught in the prayer line. Okay, so we just did whatever we could. But see, when you understand these laws, what you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. I helped others get their doctorate degree, okay, by assisting and taking the load so they could devote themselves to the timing, devote themselves to the time needed to get their doctorates. And they say it takes eight full-time years of ministry to get your doctorate degree. Well, Shemitero's a slow learner. I got mine last night, 44 years later. 
but at least I got it anyway. Okay, but what I'm saying is we helped others their dream, come on. And, and, and the motivation behind this is huge because this is how some people even see ministry. They see it just as a stepping stone into something. No, no, it's not a stepping stone. It's a building block, amen? And what you make happen for others, God's gonna make happen for you. This is the whole aspect of giving, giving of your talents, giving of your time, making the most of the opportunities. I wrote a few more down here. Uh, I, I believe this here, giving the first fruits of all your increase. How many know Proverbs speaks about that, giving God your best, and it says honor the Lord by giving him the first fruits. We don't give God the leftovers. That's what happened with Cain. We give God the first fruits. We don't dishonor God. The tithe is, in, listen, the tithe is honoring God. It's all about honor. Can you say amen? So fast forward. So we've been doing this here, Kathy and I, for 85 years. We don't question it. We don't argue with it. Uh, some people say, well, it's Old Testament. It's all done away with. It was all under the law. Well, if that's true, then the only instruction God gave to Cain and to Abel was to put God number one. And Cain didn't. He gave a leftover. And what happened? Abel gave the first ling. And how many know God accepted the one? And he told the other, if you do right, won't yours be accepted? So it's the principle so so Kathy and I did that. Now, fast forward, I go and collect a, a pension now, a Social Security check every month. It comes to about, uh, it was 1200 and some dollars a month Social Security that I get from the states working there 14 years. I didn't even know it was going to be that high, and I didn't know that 14 was the number of years you needed to get this full thing. And so I just came over and started the church over in Windsor, Ontario, not understanding anything of what was going to happen some 38 years later. And then I go and I apply for mine, and then they tell me that I'm eligible for Medicaid, and they want to pay, they want to give me full benefits now. They want to give me Medicaid 1, and they want to give me Medicaid 2, and it cost me $133 a month for that there. And so how many know many seniors now are trying to go down to the States for holidays, and they can't go because the insurance is too high? Okay, so hang on, it gets better. Okay, so I'm talking to this agent over in Washington, and, and, and she says this here. She says, are you married? And I said, well, yes, yeah, all in my paperwork. They said, well, your wife needs to uh, file for Social Security. She's eligible. And I said, well, first of all, Kathy's a Canadian. She's not a dual. They said, it doesn't matter. She's married to you. And then they, I said, well, but listen, listen, she's never worked a day over in the States. She says, it doesn't matter. She's married to you. And then I said, but ma'am, you don't understand this. She doesn't even have a Social Security number. And her answer was, well, go get her one. So that week, and I took her across the river, got her a Social Security number. Within 30 days, I started getting checks for Kathy on top of it. Okay, now, I don't know about you. I don't know about you, Pastor. But when I'm getting U.S. money right now with our exchange rate, I think I'm doing pretty good. I'm saying all that because these are things they just happen. I had no idea when I started Windsor Christian Fellowship 38 years later that I was going to get this full thing. But I did what I was supposed to do and I put seeds out there in the tithe that are now being yielded. It has actually been almost seven straight years that we've been on the receiving end, Kathy and I, of seeds that have been sown, listen very carefully, for 40 some years each. We've received cars given to us. I mean, how many people come up to you and say, any car you want, we just want you to go buy it. I'm saying Corvette. Kathy's saying minivan. <laughs> Because we had kids back then, you know? And then later, you know, so this guy comes in literally and says, anything you want, you can have. And I'm like, God, is this actually happening? And then seven years ago on our, our 30th anniversary, or almost eight years ago now, our 30th anniversary, a uh, few guys got together and says, we want to buy a pastor car. And so they went and they threw some money together and they bought me a brand new Lexus. Okay, they asked us, what car did we want if we wanted any car? And I said, well, I, I, I'd like a Lexus, you know. They said, anything you want, you can have. Okay, so I'm telling you all this here because you go back and we were faithful in the area of stewardship in our tithe. I've went through, uh, I've went through challenges in these here 40-some years of ministry, but I want to tell you, I've never seen God forsake me. I've never seen God fail me. I've never seen God disappoint me. Let me tell you something else. I've never seen God be late. He, he's an on-time God. When Kathy was dedicating her center to the Lord, she was 300000 
$10,000 short, and she was opening up the center two weeks before. And the CFO comes to him, the chief financial officer comes to her and says, Pastor Kathy, you need to get your mortgage involved right now because you're opening the center in two weeks. You're already hiring staff, and you're $300,000 short. And she said, God told me to build it, and he also told me he's going to pay for it. Well, how many know to administrative mindsets? Those people are a nightmare. Okay, but I understood where she was at. God had brought in over $1.2 million already, or $1.1 million to that point. Well, you know what? Within 24 hours of that conversation, a couple comes to our house and hands Kathy $300,000 check and pays the whole thing off. Are you all there? Now, let me tell you, I'm trying to go back and forth on this here. When Kathy started the home, she made a decision with her board that they were going to tithe off everything that came in from their board level to the woman's home. And so every month, they started tithing before the center even opened up because we were raising money for the thing. They started, and so when James Robinson gave us a check for $550,000, okay, guess what? 55000 went right out into someone else's home. So you hear about the miracles, you see the miracles, but it's good to be reminded of how these miracles took place. Now let me just take this, what God meant, what we mean for little, when there was five loaves and two fishes isn't a whole lot. But let me tell you, when you give that little to God, it becomes a whole lot to God. When you invest that time to God, it becomes a whole lot to God. Whatever it is that you have of your talent, of your ability, and you give it to God, it becomes a whole lot with God. Now, let me just show you what I'm meaning about this whole aspect here. Uh, how many know that Samson took the jawbone, a fresh jawbone, off a donkey, ripped it right out of the thing, and guess what? He took a 1,000 warriors out with one jawbone of an ass. So he took what was small. When Elijah was out there and he told his servant, he says, hey, go check out. See if there's any rain coming. See if the clouds are out there. And the servant goes out there and says, hey, John, boss, there's nothing happening. Go again. And he comes back and says, hey, boss, there's nothing happening. He said, go again. He said, boss, there's nothing happening. Go again. And you know, most Christians, if God told us to do something three times, how many know we'd stop after that and say, Four st three strikes and you're out. And we just quit. No, he said, he went a fourth time. And then he went a fifth time. And then he went a sixth time. And then he comes back every time. He says, boss, nothing's happening out there. And so he says, go again. Well, how many know by that time, listen carefully, there's a principle in that. There's times that we do things and we don't see anything happening in the natural eyes. But yet God is positioning everything in the supernatural. And I have watched this over many, many years. Let me, let me even go because this is going in a different direction. Even in building programs that we had went through. You heard the miracles that we just shared about with the tithe and everything else. But let me tell you, when we went into buildings, uh, God would tell us years beforehand, sow $100,000 into that person's building. Give that person $100,000. Are you all, all with me? And so then when it came time for our building years later, I don't even remember the seeds that we had sowed in there. And all of a sudden, what we made happen for them, God's making happen for us. And gifts were coming in for a quarter million. Gifts were coming in for $300,000 of people that we never expected, people that you never thought had anything, and they're handing in these incredible offerings and incredible checks because the seed had been in the ground all those years. So here you take it all together, everybody say giving. It's not just a work, it's a lifestyle for us. And I wrote a few scriptures down that I want you to get a hold of on this here aspect. Are you ready? Proverbs eleven twenty four says, the world of the generous, this is in the Message Bible, the world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. See, our world is enhanced today. It's, it's a big world, but how many know we serve a big God? Okay, and then generosity means this here, liberal in giving or sharing. It speaks about being unselfish, free from meanness, but listen here, free from smallness of mind or character. Right out of your dictionary, it means abundant. It means marked by abundance or ample proportions. The synonyms are, op are open-handed, free. Isaiah 32, 8 says, but generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. Do you know, I, I believe this here, and, and just read an uh, article in the National Post the other day that they're killing a Christian every six minutes in the world that we live in today. And they're bringing it out today of what's actually happening in the world. And you know what? We've sowed in to the voices of the martyrs for many, many years prior to their widows, to the ones, to their kids, to the ones that didn't have it for many, many years that not if, but when persecution hits this area of the country. 
We've already got our seed in the ground for that time for the needs of our whole families. This is how the church has got to think. we got to think proactively today. I remember preaching on end times so, oh, almost 30-some years ago and sharing about, listen, while the church is all willing to blow out of here, God says that the church is going to start off as the mustard seed, the smallest of all the seeds. But at the end, it's going to be the greatest seed of all. It's going to be the biggest of all the trees. And so God used that principle of the known world of that day, the mustard seed was the smallest of all the seeds. Come on. But God's saying at the end, it's going to be the largest of all trees. How many know Christianity is not diminishing in this day and hour today? Some of the greatest areas of persecution in the world today is because the church is growing at unprecedented and unparalleled ways today. Did you know where one of the greatest moves of God is happening right now is in Iran? They're coming into the kingdom of God. We just had, listen very carefully, we just had an Iranian, Kathy will probably share more about it, we just had an Iranian on the Easter celebration weekend that actually came into the church. And another Muslim couple actually picked him up at the shelter because his wife threw him out of the house because she can't handle him. He's been in back pain. He's been in incredible suffering. And, And that morning, Morning, this radiant man was in the shelter and he cried out to his God and he said, God, he says, if I don't get help, if something doesn't happen today, I'm going to end my life. This is the last day I want to live. I can't live with the pain. I can't live with the, the shame that I went through with my wife. I can't live anymore. And this couple goes to the shelter that knows him, comes to WCF with this guy. He's sitting in the service, sitting there. And at the middle of the service, the presence of God comes on him and totally delivers him and totally heals him right in the service and he's bawling like a baby he's crying and he can't stop weeping over the goodness of God that touched his life and so he comes in afterwards to the visitors room with this other couple that had been coming to the church for about a month that doesn't know the Lord yet but he's real close can you say amen and so here they are with this here friend and this guy now is delivered this now guy is set free and, 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 and Kathy said well what's his what's your name and so he tells her the name but he says in my upbringing he he says, when you have an experience like this here, you tell me what my name is going to be. So Kathy gave him a new name, and that's his new name today. Okay, I'm telling you, God wants to do things. God is showing up in unparalleled ways. But let me tell you why that's happening. Because every Saturday from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, all the Iraqis, all the Iranian Christians that are now born again are in the chapel at Windsor Christian Fellowship, wailing, travailing, praying for their loved ones, praying for their family members, praying for the Islamic community in the city of Windsor and crying out to God. So now we're starting to see the answer now to all these here prayers. See, everything, you can trace it back your entire life. I'm going to tell you why a lot of people are in suffering inside of their lives today and and not talking about the suffering that's according to the will of God, but they're depressed. They're living in heaviness, and oftentimes it's because of the aspect they judged others. And God says, with the measure that you judge them, that's how it's going to come back to you. I've watched over the years people that judge my kids, and they're looking for perfection of pastor's kids. How many know our kids are kids? And how many know you give them your very best, you raise them, but how many know they're in the forefront? They're in the spotlight, and they're why? Because their daddy and mommy's in there. And our kids don't need the church's judgment. Our kids need the church's encouragement, and their belief, and their faith in them. Why? Because I've lived to see it, and all 12 of our son-in-laws are all serving God today. Listen carefully, folks. This is how it all works. Have you all thought about giving encouragement? How about to the generations that are coming up? The greatest thing that Moses gave to Joshua was, Joshua, be strong and of good courage. And he said it over and over and over. Why? Because they need your faith. They need your affirmation. They need your encouragement. And let me tell every couple in here, let the encouragement start in the home with your spouse. Speak positive things over your wife. Speak positive things over your husband. Come on. Speak faith over your husband. I've had people over the years that got a hold of these principles, and they would literally sit in an area of the church where there was empty seats, and they would sit there and they'd say, Johnny's coming in here. Tony's coming in here. Sarah's coming in here. Mama, Susanna's coming in. And they would name 
name the seats and name the people. Rita Laporte, I can take you back to one of my most faithful board members in all the years. She saved a seat for her husband, Bernard. And she said, when this guy comes in, Rick, uh, Pastor Rick, he's going to serve God with all of his heart. And I know he's coming in. And she'd have that seat. And every week she thanked God that her husband was coming. He came in one day, and he went to church religiously every week, but didn't know God. Came into church one day, got born again, got baptized in the Holy Ghost, and got involved in the church, got on fire for the church, brought his family into the kids that were married into the church, and served God till he was 88 years of age in the ministry at the church. Folks, these are all the things that we could talk about. Is anybody getting anything? So everybody say, everybody stand for a moment. Look at your neighbor and say, your future is in your seed. Number two. Okay, I'm going to tell you why it's not working for some. Go ahead and sit down. Okay, giving, all right? Number two is everybody say forgiving. The Bible, you can give all the seeds. You can do it even with the right heart and the right motive. But let me tell you, if there's not forgiveness coming and being released inside of your heart, all your giving is not going to work. The Bible says this in Matthew 5, 21. It says, when you come into the house of the Lord, and there you remember in the house that your brother has ought against you. You don't even have anything against him. But you remember that he has ought against you. He says, first go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and worship. Come on. In other words, God calls giving worship. And he says, when you come in and you remember that there's ought, first deal with it. Why? Because if you throw it in, it's just going to be like holes in a bag. It's just going to go right through it. Because God puts a value on relationship. The Ten Commandments, the first five all have to do with our relationship with God, and the last five all have to do with our relationship one with another. It's amazing how they're trying to do away with the Ten Commandments today. That's another whole story. And the New Testament affirms nine of the ten. The only one that he didn't affirm was the Sabbath. Come on. Anyway, and I'll, I'll just go on from there. So forgiveness is huge to God. The Bible says, what things soever you desire when you pray. What does it say? Believe that you receive them. When? When you pray. And you shall, future tense, have them. So when you pray, you're putting your faith out there that what it is you're requesting, just as we did for the young girl today, we got our faith out there now. Come on. Our faith is out there. And, And what happens? It says when you pray, it says forgive if you have aught against any unforgiveness is it's going to hinder your life. I can tell you years ago, there was a man that did me great harm in the city. He was a fellow pastor. And whatever we did at WCF, it was just like this church was vehement against us and would always just try to block whatever we were doing. So they went into a, a, an expansion in their church, and we sent them a gift, $1,000. We always did that to people that were starting uh, building programs that were born-again churches, sending them offerings. And so anyway, they sent it back to us, and they sent a very, very nasty letter with it. And when he sent the letter back, I actually it was addressed to me, And I actually just stuck it in a file, and I said, I can't believe this guy wrote this here to me. But anyway, so my friend from Halifax comes in, and he says, Rick, how's it going in the city? And at that time, I was the president of the local ministerial. And I said, it's going incredible. I said, we had 185 pastors out in our gym for dinner uh, for last night. I said, it's just amazing what God is doing. All Essex County, all the pastors are coming together. We had an hour and a half of prayer that went on. Things are really shifting and going well. But I said, but there's one guy, man, that just we can't get along with at all. He just won't have nothing to do with us. I sent him money. He sends it back. And I told him about what this guy did. And I went to pull the letter out of the file with my friend right there. And God says, I I hate this. Get rid of it. And instantly I stuck that letter in the shredder. As soon as I stuck the letter in the shredder, God spoke to that man that I've been holding that against, and he walked into his chapel, and in the chapel he saw my face. And God spoke to him and said, you call Rick, and you make it right with him now for what you did to him. I get to call back. I come out of uh, back uh, getting ready to go out to lunch with Ted, and I knew exactly what time it was. And my secretary said, the pastor from this church called. I said, well, what did he want? He said, he wants to meet with you. He wants to come over to WCF, or he wants you to go over to his building. And this is what happened in my mind that had actually gotten in my heart. Listen very carefully. doesn't matter how well we can preach. It doesn't matter how long we've been in it. If you don't guard your heart, things can get in your heart. And this is what I thought. This is what was inside of me. I don't want him coming to WCF because I don't want him to contaminate my church. I am not proud of that. I speak about that because I'm ashamed of what had happened. 
yeah, but how that got into my heart. And so I forgave him, but I forgave him in my head. I didn't forgive him from my heart. And that day, he goes into the chapel. God visits him and shows him my face. And guess what happens in there? So I goes over to his church. I sit down. The secretary brings me into his office. He's not in there. He says, have a seat. He'll be right with you. And he pulls up a chair right up to my chair. And he says, Rick, that wasn't my board that sent this letter to you. It was me that sent that letter. And he says, I was jealous at what God was doing at WCF. And he says, yesterday at noon, I walked into the chapel and he says, God brought your face before me. And as soon as he said that, I had to open up and say to him what I happened. Come on. I said, friend, I said, my friend Ted, we were together. And I says, he showed me yesterday, I pulled out the letter. And I says, right at 12 o'clock. And, 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 and I says, I was showing it to Ted. And as soon as I did, God got a hold of me. And I put it in the shredder and got rid of it. The scripture says, whose sins you remit, they will be remitted. But whose sins you retain, they will be retained. Think about that one when you go to bed tonight. It's probably the scariest verse in the entire Bible. My unforgiveness can actually imprison someone else. And God dealt with me on that whole aspect of that. So we released it. We asked for forgiveness. I asked him for forgiveness for my attitude and told him what was going on inside of me about him, how I got hurt from that there and didn't even recognize it until, the, uh, until I was over there. And he asked me for forgiveness, that whole thing. Let me tell you, God cleansed that whole thing out. Now that church is one of our greatest allies in the entire community today. Forgive, I'm sensing strongly right now that I shared those stories today because somebody's in the room right now of unforgiveness, and it's gotten into your heart subtly just as it got into my heart. Let me just tell you a few scriptures on this that's probably very important that I read these here to you. It actually tells us love prospers. It means to be successful and fortunate. When a fault to defect, a defect, an imperfection, a flaw, a failing, a fault in one's character, responsibility for failure or a wrongful act, an error or a mistake, a misdeed or a transgression is forgiven. But dwelling on it separates closest friends. In other words, what is it speaking about there? Love forgives. Love, as it says over there, it prospers when what? When transgressions are forgiven. Dwelling on it is going to separate close friends. Listen to this here out of the Amplified. He who covers and forgives an offense seeks love, but he who repeats or harps on a matter separates even close friends. You know, in life sometimes, how many know we all make mistakes? And one of the things we don't like is when we make a mistake is to be reminded of that mistake, especially after we've acknowledged it, confessed it, and forsaken the thing, and then people keep railing on us for doing the same thing. Has anybody ever made a mistake in life? Okay, has anybody ever been had to put in your face time after time after time? Okay, a few less hands may have went up, probably because of fear sometimes. But the reality is, listen very carefully. He who covers and forgives an offense seeks love. What are you seeking today? Are you seeking first the kingdom of God? Because listen carefully, all your seeds can go into the ground, but if forgiveness is not going to be there, it's not going to prosper. Isn't it amazing in the Bible, there was a man in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it says this here about a person. You, you, you come in and you say, what if a person really hurts you dearly? What if a person really causes you great pain? Well, I, I don't think there's a, a, a greater pain inside of the human race than betrayal. And when you're betrayed, when I left my five-year-old son in charge, uh, left a relative in charge of our son at the bowling alley, and he actually took our son into the washroom and actually violated our son. And I trusted him with my child, and he violated our child. I don't think there's a greater pain than the pain of betrayal. When a spouse, you come home and your spouse is with someone else or you find out uh, from the internet or you find out from their cell that they've been with someone else, there's, there's probably no greater pain. Well, in the church at Corinth, there was a man that actually had slept with his stepfather's wife. Come on. He slept with his father's wife, his stepmother. And it says that in the Bible. Come on, in 1 Corinthians, you can read that in chapter 5. And then later on, I believe there was three letters written to Corinth to the church at Corinth. I'm not going to develop that right now. But anyway, in 2 Corinthians 2, 5, it says, I am not overstating it when I say that the man who caused all the trouble hurt all you uh, more than he hurt me. Most of you have opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Now, however, it is time to forgive 
and to comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. So I urge you, this is the church, now to reaffirm your love for him. And I wrote to you as I did to test you and see if you would fully comply with my instructions. When you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit. Something that is advantageous or good so that Satan will not outsmart us for we are not for we are familiar with his evil schemes, his plans, his design, his programs of action followed his projects, his underhanded plot. What does that mean over there? If we don't deal with these areas inside of our life, then Satan will get a legal point of entry inside of us. And I don't think there's a one of you in crossroads that wants that in any way. Amen? And so what I've recognized in bad things happen. People say malicious, defaming things now. So you fast forward. The situation I shared was many years ago. From that time to this time, I refuse to allow bitterness to get inside of my heart. I refuse to allow, listen very carefully, what people might say about me to get into my heart. I ask myself the question is what they're saying true. And if it's not true, I'm going to move on with Jesus. Can you all say amen? But I'm sensing very strongly right now in this atmosphere that there's people that you keep repeating the same thing. You keep speaking the same thing, even though it's been dealt with, even though it's been forgiven, but you haven't let go of it. You forgave from your head, but you've not forgiven from your heart. Let me just state this here. There was two leaders in the Bible, and this will get me to the final point. And his name was Hymenus and Alexander. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy, to turn such ones over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit could be saved. And the Bible goes and it says this here. 2 Timothy chapter, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 2. I will, therefore, that first of all, prayer, supplication, and intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. The all men, listen very carefully, in the context was two of the clergy that got off track. Come on. And notice he said the restoration, not only I want you to give thanks, okay, was part of that. If we can't give thanks for that individual, then it's probably still got a sting and got a hook still inside of our lives. And that's not making justification for people's wrong behaviors. It's not making uh, excuses for people's wrong choices and behaviors. There's laws and there's boundaries that you need to put up in the spirit, just like with that relative that actually violated my son my son would never, or any of our children, be alone with that individual again, okay? That's an aspect now of trust. I didn't trust the person. By the way, that individual died at 33 years of age, and you probably know what he would die of from there. The family actually said it was hepatitis, but it was actually AIDS he died of. And so you trace all these things back. There were seeds that were being sowed, and so forgiveness has to go. I have chose that in the ministry, and I believe that I'm where I'm at today in God, in my walk with God and the favor of God, because I've chose to be a step ahead of the enemy in the area of allowing bitterness and unforgiveness in. Isn't it amazing to the church, God says, Put away all bitterness and wrath and evil speaking amongst you. So apparently there was bitterness. Apparently there was wrath. Apparently there was evil speaking in the church at Ephesus that knew all the in him realities. Apparently there was things now that the apostle was saying, you need to deal with these issues, Ephesus. We need to get these here things out. Because if we don't get these things here out, then guess what? We're not going to shine as the bright lights. Amen? The last thing that I want to just briefly tell you is you can do all the giving and you can do all the forgiving, but if it's not intertwined with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is the byproduct of every, it's the byproduct, and it seals the deal for every good thing that God has in your life. I've recognized this here. The Bible says in the Message Bible, Psalm 100, verse 4, enter in with the password, thank you, God. Amen? There's a password that attracts the presence of God, and it's that of gratitude. I've recognized, I've written, I've written a book on this. I got the materials ready for my second book that I plan on writing this year's summer. I got about five weeks off that I plan on doing two books during that there time. I got four of them on the burner that I want to write right now, okay? But I want to get gratitude part two out there because there's so many things that I have learned about that since I wrote the first book. And the first book has been a real incredible seller. It's in its third printing now. But the, the, the second one that we're writing on there has so many things on pathways and aromas and things that attract the presence of God. So the best way that I can describe this last point is this here. 
Gratitude is actually a spiritual magnet that attracts the presence, the power, and the provision of God to your life. The Bible says, let the earth praise thee, let all the earth praise thee, then the earth shall yield her increase. The word praise means a voice of thanksgiving and gratitude to God. Then the earth shall yield her increase. The increase is always on the other side of a grateful life. Amen? I've recognized the Bible says in everything, circumstance. You know, yesterday was one of the most trying days of my personal life, okay? We had to get off the boat yesterday morning, and in order to catch the flight that we had to catch, we had to leave very early in the morning, so we went up for breakfast at 6 o'clock. We were one of the first ones up, and we're number one in line to get off the ship, okay? Well, they have no wheelchair service early, so Kathy had her crutches, and we ended up have to walk to the S to the escalator. Now, we couldn't go down the escalator, so we had to go the elevator, and that was at the end of the terminal. She had to actually walk on crutches over a kilometer, okay? And so the time she got there, she's kind of like wiped out, and there was probably 300 or more people that passed her walking, and I got the four suitcases, the two, and then the other ones on the top, the carry-ons on the top, and I'm pulling these things through there, and we, so we get out there, we get in the taxi, and then we get to the airport, and then our flight gets delayed an hour and 50 minutes, and I had a the ceremony last night for my to get my doctorate degree, and that the service is supposed to start at three and end at five o'clock. Well, we're over at Air Canada at terminal, and and we get through Nexus because we have the global entry, so we got right through, and then we get to the where the luggage is, and the conveyor breaks down, and it took another half hour for that to come. By this time, it's almost ten to four, and we got to be over in Whitby, so we jump on the four hundred seven, and by by this time, like I'm just stressed, okay. And, and trying to get there, and it's like I'm looking forward to this here time and everything else. And Kathy kept saying, but Rick, you preach and everything, give thanks. Just give God thanks right now. I said, Kathy, I'm really trying, but I'm struggling. She says, Rick, you know how to do it. Just give God thanks. Amen? So we did get God thanks. We got to the ceremony, and seven minutes after I got my gown and my cap on and everything else, they brought me to the second row. In seven minutes, I was the first one that they asked up on the stage. And it's like, no pressure, no stress. Just been in Amsterdam at 7 o'clock in the morning. Come on. And here we are. So anyway, I'm saying all that there because I've recognized that people that have these things happen that we shared earlier are people that live grateful lives. You trace it back and you see the murmurs and the complainers. You see the whiners. They're usually always struggling with something of finances, struggling with their health, struggling with their marriage, struggling. Because why? They're looking at things from a critical spirit is at the root of the murmuring and complaining in their life. And a woman at WCF one time, I shared on this here point, she actually got a hold of it, and she was the number one whiner in the plant that she worked at in Windsor. And after the first shift that she was on, the upper management called her up into the office and said, we want to know, because she heard it on a Wednesday night. On the Thursday, she went into church and said, I'm cleaning that up. I'm not going to whine. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to murmur. I'm going to go to this one and build them. I'm going to encourage that one. I'm going to do everything that Pastor Rick said tonight. She went in, and the upper management called her in and said, we just want to know what happened to you. She said, I went to church last night, and I heard that all my complaining and whining was from the devil, and that church helped me to see God's perspective, it, and I'm just thankful that I have a job, and I'm thankful for you that are here today. And it changed your whole life, okay? So I want everybody to stand right now, okay? And lift up your hands right now and say, Father, today I give you not a piece of my heart, but I give you my whole heart. I give you my time. I give you my talents. Pastor Travis, come on, say it with me. Pastor Travis said that 80 of the 150 are involved in helps. God, today, take my gift, take my talent, and help me to be willing to serve, that it would go from 80 to 150. Father, be it done for our church in Jesus' name. Father, may I be one that daily will give God the first part of my day, the first part of my time, and the first part of my income, the tithe that's holy, and it teaches me to fear you. God, today, forgive me for the grudges, the unforgiveness, the hurts that I have held towards anyone. Now, I'm, I'm sensing there's a father and a daughter relationship that's went way south. And God's saying, if you will call her and humble yourself, that relationship will be restored. But the key's in your hand, Dad. The key's in your hand. I'm sensing right now that there's a 
in a marriage in this year, and I'm sensing two marriages right now, that when I hit about repeating it over and over and over, it's like taking the dirty and putting it in the person's face for their past mistakes. And I hear the voice of God saying, it's time to turn the page. It's time to release it from your head and now release forgiveness from your heart. And when you do, what you look for will be restored back into your life because it's been blocked to this here point. It's blocked you also in even hearing my voice in the past, says the Spirit of God. But it's a new day, and it's a new page that's going to turn. I'm also sensing that there's individuals here that have gotten very, very bitter, and it's coming out in conversations now, even towards the government. The Bible says we are still to honor the king. That does not mean we agree with the policies that the king is setting in the precedents that are coming in, but there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. And the dishonoring spirit God is saying today needs to be dealt with inside of your heart because it's blocking the flow of the provision that I have for your life and home. And God's saying that there's a couple that's here that if the two of you will start daily joining together for your lost loved ones, that you're going to see those loved ones come into the kingdom of God. And you will know that it was a miracle wrought by the hand of God. For I have a supernatural intervention there, and I've been waiting for the two of you to quit complaining about them and start thanking me for them. And it's going to shift around. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. There's someone here that had, and I'm hearing the year 13 years ago, you had an abortion, and you, you've forgiven others of what they've done, but you're still holding it against your own self. And God's saying it's time this morning, it's time now to forgive yourself. Hallelujah. Forgive yourself. There's someone that made a really bad choice in a business decision, and it brought real havoc with inside of the marriage. And it's still in havoc form. It's still in chaos that's gone on because there's a spirit of strife that has been released from that their situation. And God's saying today that you need to forgive him and you need to release him today for there's things that God he has. It was a prematurity that he had stepped out in, but the gift that God had given of creativity is being hindered today and blocked. And God's saying release it today in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody lift up your hands right now. Everybody lift up a voice of thanksgiving to God. Everybody begin to thank God for the one next to you today. Everybody begin to thank God for your children. Begin to thank God for your grandchildren. Begin to thank God for your pastors. Begin to thank God for your church. Begin to thank God for the move of what he's going to do in Trenton. Begin to thank God for the future. Begin to thank God for his provision. Begin to thank God for your health that's going to speedily spring forth. Begin to thank God. I'm sensing right now there's a healing presence of God here where there's forgiveness being released. There's a healing that's taking place inside of the room. I'm sensing right now that there's been a little bit of biting that's been going on, a little bit of biting at one another, and it's just been nipping away at one another in relationships, and God's saying it's time to put that ax to the root of the tree and release the forgiveness and release the grace of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Where it says about separate even closest friends, and I'm sensing that even within a few homes, there's been a separation and a distance that has taken place, and God's saying, it's time. It's time. It's time. Humble yourselves one to another and watch what the Spirit of the Lord is going to do in the inside of you. Watch and see if your prayers will not be like hybrid seed, that you'll see the salvation and you'll see the deliverance and you'll see the freedom that you've longed to walk in. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now, God, touch every mind. Those with physical ailments, lift up your hands right now. Physical ailments right now. Just lift them up real high. I want those around you that don't have an ailment to turn to them right now. Okay, everybody look around that doesn't have it for the ones that have their hands up. I command the healing of Christ into your body, into your emotions, in the name of Jesus. I command the wholeness and well-being of Christ to break forth upon your life in the name of Jesus. 
right now. Thank you, Father. Everybody this lay hands. Lay hands on those right now. Lay hands around you, the ones that are infirm right now. I command it. I command it. I command. I command all heaviness over everyone in this room to be released of its assignment off of your life in the name of Jesus. I thank you for a spirit of rejoicing that is hitting hearts, that is hitting bodies, that is hitting emotions in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God's healing a womb right now. Some of you have been trying to have a child, and I believe that you can mark it down by next year at this time. You're going to have that child. So you just hold on. You just hold on to that provision. You hold on to this. Last thing, and there's so many things I want to share, and Kathy and I are going to get a little rest after lunch today and be a little more refreshed. It's been a long week. Can you say amen? But I'm going to tell you something. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, you be the giver, you be the forgiver, and you be the thanks giver, and your life will change. Hallelujah. Your life's going to change, honey. Your life's going to change. Your life's going to change. Your life's going to change. Amen. Your life's going to change. How many needed to hear what was shared today? How many got hope today? Amen. How many are going to see God? You're going to see loved ones. You're going to start pointing to see. You better start saving a seat right now for the loved one because there's not going to be many more seats that's going to be in here. I believe you're going to be like magnets. It's just going to attract the presence of God into the people in your life. They're going to can't wait to come, can't wait to get around you. Amen? I believe there was somebody here today that was just like that, that woman that was at WCF from the plant. I believe that spoke right into the heart of someone that your co-workers that you've been believing for and praying for that haven't come to Christ, they're going to come to Christ when they see that shift take place in your life. And I hear it's both the male and a female that's going to take place in, and everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, tonight you get to see my better half, Kathy. Amen. And all I ask for is that tomorrow that you pray for us, Pastors Travis and Pastor Camilla are hosting the Connect Day. I know it's going to be a great time. Amen. And I want you guys to do one thing more. Let's give thanks for your pastors right now. Come on. These are people. We are, we're guests. We're here. And we're gone in a couple of days. But they're here with you with your babies. They're here with you with your families. They're here with you with the young ones. They're here with you building a strong generational church for the weeks, months, and years to come. One more thank offering to your pastors. Amen. This is the last thing that I ask you to do. And pastor, you can have it. Is the success, I believe, of longevity in ministry that Kathy and I have had is because our congregation prayed for us on a daily basis. I birthed that book, I Pray for Your Pastor, okay, out of the experiences of life. And I'll tell you what, when hundreds of people get a hold of it and they pray daily, even if it's two, three minutes a day with thanksgiving for your pastor, I'm going to tell you, you're going to see miracles and you're going to see the kingdom of God expand. Amen. Thank you for listening. We hope that you enjoyed our message. If you are in the Quinty West area, we would love to have you visit us on Sunday morning at 24 Dundas Street West, Trenton, Ontario. Check out our service times on our website at atthecrossroads.ca.